What what motivated you to uh, reach out to me? Well, here's the thing. Uh, I know a lot of people say this about themselves, but I am the biggest Elton John fan I know, right? Ah, okay. Right. So I'm on these Facebook groups with uh, Pat and what was her? Linda, I think. L Linda, she's fabulous. Linda. She, yeah, exactly. And the thing is, I knew the suit. I knew the suit that you made for Elton for his concert in Central Park. Uh, I've known it since I was a kid because I watched that gig over and over again. Crazy gig. It's one of the best. It's one of his best shows, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And and yeah. definitely the one with the biggest audience. I don't think he's ever had. No, that was 500,000 people. Exactly. Yeah. Plus, it's been televised and released on so many formats. Right. And, and, and the weird thing was that nobody ever did a piano outfit. Even this was 1980. But he was already a megastar, you know, with costumes and everything by 1980. And nobody ever did a piano outfit. So it was it was ironic that I did that. There were set there were six or seven outfits that I did, but that one, that one got to him the night before new the night before Central Park. Oh and wow. I didn't, I didn't even know about the Central Park concert until like the next week when that picture of him in that outfit was in Time magazine. So you're telling so, me El Elton John, nobody thought of doing an outfit with piano keys for Elton John. Amazing. No. Wow. <laughs> that was the first, because he's done a lot of piano key here, there, whatever, but not a whole outfit like that. And and I think all the other ones with little bits and pieces of piano keys and things came afterwards. And what was your reaction? Because I'm, I'm pretty sure you didn't know about a, the gig. You just said you didn't know about the gig. About well, it's kind of, market. it's kind of a, it's a backstory. Do you want me to tell you the backstory then? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. It, it's a great showbiz. It is a showbiz story. And I and I wish I could I wish I could uh, meet with him at some point, and and just let him know the story because he was lucky, I <laughs> think he was lucky too that he got that outfit, you know, the night before. Because if if he hadn't had that outfit, it would have been the duck outfit, the right. duck suit for the encore. But then the other outfits that that were made by uh, Bob Mackey, who I normally really like, but his costumes were these spandex. I mean, spandex cowboy outfits. And if you have any, if you're overweight at all, spandex is not attractive. Right. <laughs> yeah. So at any rate, um, I'll, I'll tell you the story. So I, I was living, um, I was living in another area of Los Angeles. Then I was walking, I was married then and we were walking our dog and this guy comes up to me in the street, introduces himself and says, he's a big fan of mine and that he owns an embroidery company. And that he thought that my stuff would look really good in embroidery. And I thought, well, I love embroidery. It's like, who doesn't like embroidery? So I, I thought, wow, that's cool. And, but I didn't have anything at the moment. So I said, you know, that's a great idea. And if anything comes up, I'll call you. So honest to God, two weeks after that guy came up to me in the street, I get a call, like from a friend, um, I, I had a big show on Melrose, which is a kind of a fashion street in Los Angeles in 1980, which I, I look at as kind of my breakout show. And um, they were they were a combination shoe store and art gallery, and they were all custom made shoes. They were expensive shoes. They were custom made. And I would I would do a, a kind of a tennis shoe version of their of their shoe. And then I would paint them and the people would have to sit in a chair for like two hours while the shoe is like fashioned around your foot. So anyway, um, I had a show there and uh, a friend of mine who evidently met Elton or something at that time in LA, and he recommended Elton to come see my show on Melrose, which wow. he did. And I, and thank God, cause he just showed up, you know, it just popped in with, a, with you know, with, with his assistant or whatever. And thank God I was there. Jesus, because, you know, thank God I was there. So, um, and that was just my chance, too. Um, so I was there. He came in, and he wanted to get a pair of shoes. So to get those pair of shoes, though, he had to sit in the chair for two hours. So he was like a captive audience for me <laughs> for two hours. And another, thank God, I am going on, but, but this is like one of my big story, uh, Hollywood stories. So um, thank God, a couple of days before this happened, I I happened to rent, or somehow I happened to rent, I think I rented the video or something 
but it was the video of Elton John going to Russia with Ray right. Cooper. Yeah, sure. Nineteen seventy. His, 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 right. His fa his first time in Russia. Yeah. And he didn't know if they were going to know who he was or whatever. But everybody knew who he was, you know. And the mo he had, you know, mobs. He's in the, up in the terrace, and the zillions of people are down there, you know, like the dictator thing and all that. Yeah. Because as, as it turned out, because of you know West Germany. So all the Russian soldiers or whatever, they they taped the radio. And then, you know, that, that, that got back to Russia. So everybody knew who Elton John was, right? Mm -hmm. But that was the first time I ever saw Ray Cooper. And I thought, oh, my God. I mean, I thought the two of them, only the two of them, without a band even, I thought was just sensational. I mean, you know Ray Cooper, right? Sure. Yeah, I love yeah. him. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. I mean, genius, too. Yeah. I mean, Crazy. Absolutely madman. Yeah. It's phenomenal in every way, in every way. It's just perfect. So I love that show. So that was like, luckily for me, I had that to talk. I was excited about that. I'd just seen that. So I was able to talk about that with Elton. But honestly, you know, Elton at that time, it was very tricky because unbelievable. I mean, he is Elton John and all that, but he very insecure, very, very insecure. And, and it would be like, if, if you gave him a compliment, he would write you off. I mean, really, really weird. Because you think, oh, he's Elton John. I mean, he's got to be thinking. But no, he's very kind of negative. But he's changed. That was his days of rock, drug, sex, and rock and roll days. 1980. The height of it. Oh. You know. So not until, because he's turned out to be such an incredible, you know, person now. And his whole life as a, as a human being, much less as a genius and all that his whole life has turned out so well i mean amazingly enough right so at any rate um so i get a call this one day two weeks later after that guy came up to me in the street and um and it was this this mutual friend this uh, mutual friend who owned a um 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 uh, a clothing store that he designed to close uh, uh across the street from where i was having my show so and he turned out to be friends with elton so El they were together at some place and, and Elton was complaining that he hated these costumes that he had gotten from Bob Mackie for this 1980-81 world tour. And he asked my friend if, if he would like to design something, but it was all at the last second. And if he'd like to design something. And uh, he said, oh, you sure. And how about if I got Mirapolsky to come in and, and do art on the fabric? And because Elton had just come to my show about two months, that's right. He came to me about two months before I got that call. So evidently, you know, he remembered who I was and everything. And he just said, sure. So I so I got a call at four o'clock in the afternoon from this guy asking, would you like to do last minute uh, costumes for Elton John? He hates these other costumes. And they said, I'd like to do these with him. And would you like to do artwork, you know, on, on, these, on, the, on these forms? And of course, I mean, I was a big fan of Elton John 1980. And uh, so I said, of course, of course. So I had to do, I did like 27 drawings that night, all night long, because there was a messenger being sent to me the next morning at 10 o'clock. Then those drawings were being taken to Elton. And then, and then he was going to pick out the ones from the drawings. That all happened. I did the 27 drawings. Um, oh, and while, I, and while I was doing the drawings, coming up with the ideas, that was when the piano key outfit came up. And um, and I thought because I, I have a um, my education is really in the theater as an actor. So in my 20s, I, I did a lot of Shakespeare, a lot of Shakespeare festivals. So I was very familiar with, you know, big presences and costumes and all that stuff. So I swear when I did that piano outfit, I really did that for me, <laughs> because if I if I could ever be anything else, I would love to be Elton John. I would love to be able to play the piano, <laughs> you know, like that. I'd love to sing like that. I mean, you know, I mean, who doesn't want to be a rock star? And he would be the consummate rock star. So I really did that for me because on that outfit, the whole outfit is about power. The 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 the, the, the keyboards in the front are supposed to be like those uh, Mexican bandits with, you know, how they put the uh, the bullets. Yeah. Thing. yeah. So that's how that started. And then went back to the back, it becomes a lightning bolt. And then I, I put arrows and lightning bolts on his cuffs. So when it's a close-up of him playing the piano, you see these lightning bolts around his cuffs. Everything about that costume and 
and the pants were all about arrows, lightning bolts. Everything about that thing was a power outfit, which I, I think, you know, really worked. It's subliminal, but it was there because obviously he could he can carry that off. But at any rate, so um so I did those drawings. They were they were they were driven to, the, to Elton. He picked out seven of them. And I and and within that time, within a 24 hour period, I did those drawings. I got the call, I did the drawings, and then I called the embroidery guy. There's something to do with embroidery because as I'm doing those drawings all night long, I'm thinking, how can I how can I apply paint to a fabric for at least a 50,000 seat venue? I remember I, I didn't know 500,000 people, you know, a central yeah. park, mm -hmm. but I was just averaging out 50,000 seat venues, right? What would show up? Because I, I thought if you just paint fabric with lights and everything, it'll just fade, you know, it'll, it'll just go away. So I thought embroidery, because I just thought the embroidery thread, it's all sewn, it's on the surface. So it's more opaque. So I thought that it would show up better, which it did. But what I didn't know, yeah, man, what I didn't know was how fantastic it would show up. <laughs> because as it turns out, the embroidery thread is like a satin thread. So even, and there are metallic, there are metallic uh, thread, uh, em embroidery threads as well. But all the embroidery threads in general are kind of metallic. The metallic ones are, are more metallic than the regular thread, but even the regular thread is, is metallic. So I found out, you know, way after the fact, um, that that embroidery thread, when you have la large areas of, em of embroidery, uh, on, like on a costume or on, something like that, when the sun light hits it, it doesn't absorb any light. It reflects the light back into the camera. So you could take a shot of that outfit from across a fit football field, and there won't be any fading at all everything will be crystal clear. So the combination of the piano man in the piano outfit in central New York Central Park with 500,000 people, a live audience, in an outfit that took an incredible photograph. That made it, because it's always at the end of the day, to me, it's always about the photograph. It's always about the picture, because the event can happen and it, and it happens and it goes away. But the pictures never go away. And now with the advent of YouTube, man, if you've ever done anything on TV, it's there forever. <laughs> now, you know, with YouTube, it's gone forever. So interestingly enough about that costume, um, yeah, man. So I, I, I wasn't, I wasn't directly hired by Elton. I was, I was, I was like a, a sub, a subcontractor. But my my wife or my ex-wife, she ended up working for him in Los Angeles. And so and I had a big car accident in 1984 where I was almost killed. Yeah. And uh, and he sent and he was sent me notes and sent flowers, you know, all that stuff. So that that was that was all nice. But but um what was I gonna say? Oh yeah. So with Linda. So I did these costumes, they're out there. I, you know, and I I never thought about contacting any Elton John um, fan clubs or anything. I, I never even thought about it until I was, I, Linda, I think, was the one that first reached out to me. Mm -hmm. And th through Linda, they did an interview with me, wh which was, uh, which I basically it was, because they want to know the inside story of, because they're looking, obviously, big fans are looking for any kind of inside story. Uh, uh, anything at all of, of in his life or whatever. So everybody knew this outfit because I, I, I think in all modesty, I think the general consensus with all the different Elton John fans now I've met over the last what, two years or so, uh, that the, the, the piano outfit has to be in the top three or five fav all-time favorites. Right. Of, of everybody. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and everybody knows that outfit, 100%. Yeah. Everybody Especially if they if they're fans of Elton, but honest to God, that outfit, you know, it is overall it's the most famous thing I've actually done. I mean, because I, I could I could just point at a person in a crowd and say the Elton John piano outfit, and probably that person would know it. So it's like instant instant um, recognition, 
you know, by really, you know, just unbelievable. So it's incredible if you were Elton John himself. I mean, that, that kind of, you know, that kind of visibility is amazing. But at any rate, so Linda contacted me and I did this interview and um, it was fabulous. And they became, and I, I, you know, I, I know everybody on my, we're on, you're on my Facebook. That's how we met. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, all that information gets out there. And, and um, when Elton John came to uh, LA last year for the end of, that was his last American, North American show at Dodger stadium. Um, everybody, uh, I don't know about 20 people uh, because everybody came from all over the world. You know, everybody was here from all over the place. And when I did that first, when I did that first um, interview with them, you know, I, it was funny because when I was doing that and everybody's, this was a, maybe a dozen people in this interview. Mm -hmm. So everybody's, everybody's uh, picture was up there and it was Scotland. It was England. It was Germany. I, I, and I thought, Oh my God, it is like, I am here. I am in my, in my art garage in, in downtown Los Angeles because of technology, right? Being yeah. able to do this, being able to talk to the world like this. And you look good and everything. I can see you, everything, right? But you're in Romania, for God's sake. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, it's yeah. amazing. So, so that was like that was some kind of a uh, an epiphany. And uh, anyway, so you know, we all kept in touch, and and they're friends. And you see, I, you, I post. You see my posts and stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so they came here for the for the for the uh, Dodger Stadium thing, and they came to my studio the day of, and I went with them at night um uh to the show but they came here and they bought all my they bought all my original drawings yeah i saw that i said you kept them and you didn't give them away until that moment when you gave them to those diehard elton fans well i sold them i sold oh, them yeah yeah because I, i i just had them i never had them up for sale or anything because I, i i never thought about it really and i just kept it as my own historical reference or something and um but i thought And I can always use money. <laughs> I'm a freelance artist, you know. So um, I thought this would be a good crowd. And sure yes. enough, it was. Yeah. So and they were all, they. so my experience, Elton has fantastic fans. <laughs> I love his fans. They're all wonderful people. And now, and now here you are, Alex. Well, so um, a testimony again. <laughs> so he really does have good fans. And I, and I, And I, I'm just so happy for him in his life that I think like what well, he's like 76 now. Um, but I think he really appreciates himself now, which is great because I do think for a long, long time, especially before he got sober, um, he had a real, I think he had a really bad self um, uh, esteem. Mm -hmm. Amazingly enough, a really bad self-esteem issues yeah you you wouldn't you, know, gone. you wouldn't tell yeah no but you know it's interesting because trying to die trying to like, dissect him and his career you know reading his book and everything i mean i think he's an absolute genius i mean it's mind-blowing to me the amount of work and great work i mean he, this guy has never stopped working He's like a, a, a machine or something, right? He's never stopped working. And I, and I, really, I really think that's really what saved that, that his art is really what saved him. And that as fucked up as he could be at times, he could still always show up and do the work. And that's what really, really, um, that's what saved him. That's what saved him. Yeah. So anyway, now we dissected Elton. But... Uh, But anyway, so that's the story of those costumes. So that the costumes all happened at the very last minute. I didn't and, know. Uh, and it's just like destiny or fate or something. So I feel he was lucky too, because I, you know, and, and he has said to mutual people that that costume is in his top three favorite costumes of, of in his career. So he has said that himself. Amazing. Yeah. Right. So uh, I I was looking at some of your early work on your website, uh, the stuff that you did in the in the late '60s. I love it. You know, it has that kind of late '60s uh, psychedelic vibe to it. Uh, and uh, I saw, you know, you did uh, some works 
where you included uh, pictures of uh, Richard Nixon. Right, right. Yeah. So I was thinking at the time you were. I, I've always, I've always had kind of a political bent. Yeah, that's grew... that, that's what I was gonna ask. What was that? Some sort of a political statement, maybe with the Vietnam War at the time, whatever was yes. going. Yes, it, okay. it was. I'm sure it was. But so I grew up overseas. I was born in Paris. Yeah. Which is an interesting story. Uh, that's another story, but it's an interesting story. Uh, I was born in Paris, and I lived in in France, Austria, Thailand, Korea, Indonesia, Iran. Am I leaving something out? I'm not sure. Because of your dad, right? Yes. Because he so was I grew up a lot. My, my first 18 years were totally overseas. That's that's crazy. Right. Amazing. It is. It was a it was a great it was a great childhood. So how did those 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 that exposure to all sorts of different cultures? I mean, Thailand, Iran, completely different cultures. Uh, right. That must have influenced your outlook on art. Well, it did. Totally, it did. Um, because most of these countries that I lived in were about a thousand years old, let's say, you know, they all had like, I mean, America is nothing. I mean, it's what, 250, 300 years old. And in a historical perspective, for a country like that to become as successful as this country's become, yeah, like there's, a, there's years, a church, there's a it's church. It's like across, nothing. Yeah, there's a church across the street that's older than the USA. So, yeah, exa exactly. <laughs> it's nothing. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, um, so the thing that really impressed me uh, in all these cultures, because these cultures, they all generally had, a, at one time, they had a place in the sun. But what really impressed me, and my father was an artist as well. So I had I had his influence from day one. And being born in Paris uh, with artistic parents, I, I believe I got Picasso, by, for good or for bad. I, I, I believe I got Picasso by the time I was like one years old. And um, so I... I, I Art, I saw art as being a great, great communicator. I, I always saw it as being a powerful entity because I always, I grew up in, in these countries generally, which were two class systems, you know, really, really rich. And then everybody else, I mean, because not kind of middle class, but poor to middle class a little bit. But they'd been like that for, you know, a thousand years or something. So people were acclimated to their lot in life. So they, 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 they go with, Wow. They just go with the way they're born. They accept their lot in life and they go on from there. So um, I, I always saw how art was very, very powerful. I never I never looked at art really as a la di da thing. And I always saw art, especially, um, you know, like when they're having coups and revolutions and marching in the street and stuff. And they would have slogans and they do artwork with fists and hands and, you know, all that stuff. I love that. I just loved all that. So a big a big part of my uh, art career, which this is one of them, Viva LA, um, is coming up with a slogan. I have a thing about three words or less. Coming up with a slogan and matching it with some kind of a graphic that helps to sell it. So Viva LA is is a a slogan that I that I coined about sixteen years ago, and. Uh, Somebody else came into my life about six years ago, and we're partnered now on on Viva LA because our this is we're looking to this is a design to celebrate the creative culture of Los Angeles, but also to give Los Angeles a catchphrase, a la "I love New York." Mm -hmm. You know that one, right? Yeah, I love New York. Yeah, yeah. Because I love New York has been, uh, let's say phenomenally successful for New York as far as money goes um, because they, they came up with I Love New York I believe like 1977 when New York was in a really dark place and they want to revitalize cent uh, uh, what the central uh, not Central Park um, Times Square all that stuff so the state of New York came up with they came up with that I, that's the story how they came up with it but I love the I heart New York so um, when the designer of that designed that on a napkin on his way to the meeting um, and gave it to them on the meeting, and that was it, um, that the first year New York, that was for New York State, not just for Manhattan, but the first the first year of, of that New York paid like $40 million to promote I Love New York. But since 1977 to now, that thing has made over a trillion and a half dollars for New York. And uh, it's amazing to me how more cities 
haven't done something like that. So if 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 we can, um, oh, and I just, uh, oh, hold on a second. I'm gonna I'm gonna get something. I'll be right back. Yeah, sure. Okay, so this just happened. This is news. Okay. <laughs> so in August, I was approached by this magazine, Los Angeles Magazine. Right. Okay. And this is their best. This is a one once one one once a year. One it's an annual issue of Best of LA. I mean, they have this twelve issues, but once a year they do a Best of LA issue. And they asked me if I do the covers, and I use the covers to do obviously Viva LA. And uh, this is the biggest promotion that the logos had so far. This just happened. I'm still dealing with the fallout from from these two covers. They're pretty. I, I, yeah, they're great. I love these. Yeah, very powerful. Amazing to me that they that they did this because it's like propaganda or something. <laughs> they so look, anyway, they they look amazing. Yes, they they do. They do. Yeah, I love it. So um, so and, and I have this to hold up actually, because uh, if people want to go to Viva LA the website, there it is. Cool, <laughs> great. Because we have T-shirts, we have all kinds of things there but you you're good with uh coming up with slogans and matching them with all sorts of uh art mediums fear no art right right uh, exactly very good man totally that's another fear no art viva la pro peace no where the see my one it's pro peace is another one that i did as a story but yes you're right but that 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 fear no art thing as far as i've read that came to you after your car wreck in the 80s Wow, and uh, you know, it's like uh, that became kind of that very, very, very popular catchphrase in the '90s, right? In the '80s and the '90s, it lasted. It, I at the height, I had about three hundred so museums around the country that were selling uh, prints, watches, T-shirts, fear no art. Yeah, it, and it became political. It became the government used it, and then it was used against the government. It was used by the government. It's been through the mill. So it's amazing to me the power of three words. Yeah. And now three words can be interpreted in so many, many, many different ways. You know. Is it true that Bill Clinton mentioned yes. Fear No Art? Well, he somebody gave him a Fear No Art button, which he really liked, and he put on his lapel. And then they kind of made, when he was running for president, he made that the kind of the catchphrase for what his Clinton culture was going to be about right about hearing no art so that was that was written up in an art uh, like a sunday article around the country and that was in a i don't know how many papers on that sunday yeah and i also read that vincent price wrote it uh wore it wore the button wow good man that's wild you've done your your homework yeah i've done well <laughs> so i would say my the two biggest celebrity influences in my career well, B Bette Midler was big too, but and Quincy Jones, yeah. But um, I would say overtly Elton, and uh, and and uh, Vincent Price, because Vincent so Vincent Price founded a gallery at a at a at a college here in Los Angeles, East LA College, back in 1956, and this was in East LA, which was like po kind of poverty, but Latino and. I think they had it was all they had mud mud grounds there at the college and everything. Mm -hmm. But Vincent Price's passion in his life was art art education and art and art um, uh, collecting. So he picked East LA College to be re the recipient of his art collection, and which was very which was a very very big art collection. But then he got other Hollywood friends of his that were also art collectors to also donate. To this college so I, I believe that this college it's a junior college and uh, i think it has the biggest art collection of any well as definitely of any junior college but of any college i think anywhere so um so the curator of the of his of his now it's called the vincent price museum um so it was in chicago the art institute of chicago and saw the fear no art button there and thought wow vincent price would love this button this is this, this was his life Logan. So uh, he got the button, bought the button, brought it back to Vincent Price, another lapel thing. So he put it's in the it's in a, a catalog that I have the story.
but he put the button on his on his uh, robe and uh, never took it off. And he died like uh, nine months later, six months later, something like that. But before he died, he had a last wish, which he told his curator, whoever the artist is that did, that did this button, he should get a show in my place. You should offer him whatever he wants to do in my in my museum. You should offer him that. And then he dies. And this guy wrote this down. It's it's actually written. It's a true story, I believe. So uh, six years later, after his death, I uh, I get a knock on the door, and it's this uh, curator who tells me this story. And I, I was familiar with, because I knew my, my parents were fans of Elton's, uh, not Elton, of, of, uh, of uh, um, was it, Vincent Price's, because they knew about his art collecting and his passion for teaching and all that stuff. So I, I knew I knew that he had this uh, museum out in his college. So the guy's telling me how about, you know, telling me the story how he, before he died, he wished, and then, you know, he's offering me anything I want to do. So I ended up having a 25-year retrospective show there. That was in 2000. And um, and I'm still here and still, uh, you know, plug, plugging away. That's yeah. amazing. It is, it is kind of amazing. Because actually, for Vincent Price to be the person, of all people, to come to, to come at me and do a tremendous thing for me in my life, from beyond the grave, six years for Vincent Price, the goal, right? He's like the master of horror and all that stuff for him to come from the grave and affect my life really in a really big way that's a great story that's an incredible story yeah it really is <laughs> he's like the perfect person from beyond the grave vincent price yeah couldn't have been anybody else but him and it was, yeah. and it was only based 100 percent on that button that is yeah. fantastic what I didn't know, and I, I, I was uh, kind of, uh, as they say, you know, flabbergasted when I found out one of my favorite artists, and it's it's kind of hard to, um, you know, in Eastern Europe to find people that are fans of this artist, but uh, I love Tatsuro Yamashita. I don't even know if that's the way you pronounce it. Like, Tatsuro Yamashita. Yama, how do you say that? Uh, Tatsuro Yamashita. Oh, uh, Yamashita. Yeah, exactly. I think I, you feel right. Yeah. So but, you, but wait, hold on a second. Can you hear the fan? Is this too loud? No, it's fine. You can't hear it? Okay, great. Oh, yeah. So you did the, a, a cover um, for his album. Two covers. Two, Two covers, covers. For, his, for his record. Um, how was that experience to work with him? He's a, he's a genius in Japan. I don't know if he's like well-known outside Japan. I don't think he is. I don't think he is either. But in Japan, I think he's like Bob Dylan or something. Yeah. He, he is like the top of the pyramid. In, yeah. in Japan. So for me to have done those two, and what I love about the Japanese, one of the things I love about the Japanese is that once you do something that really makes a dent, they never forget it. And it's not like, like in America, to a big extent, it's like you're only as good as your last reinvention. <laughs> you got to keep coming up. And you in always Japan, have to come up with, with something all the time, right? All the time. Yeah. In Japan, they really appreciate it. If you've done something really notable, they, they they're good with that forever so my two big I, I did a lot of things in japan i had a big run for about five years in japan when japan was buying up the world remember in the late what was that the late 80s early 90s and um two of my those two album covers and one of them was and they were both well at least one of them i started with the album cover and that look from the album cover went into the his whole his whole um um tour yeah and um, and one of the albums was a double album and it was a collection um it was called love I mean love um but both of those albums all those albums they sold millions so those are that's a credit I am now piggyback in Japan with Tatsuro Yamashita and that's forever <laughs> in Japan that is really forever so he would be like an Elton John equivalent, I guess, for the Japanese yeah, culture. Yeah, probably, yeah. yeah. But, but Elton is really big in Japan, too. So, you know, he, everywhere. But yeah, Tatsuro isn't big, I don't think, overseas. He's just... Not at know. all. Not at so all. How did you get to work with him? Uh, that wasn't your well, first time working uh, Japan commissions. 
Well, I, I, I had a, um, interesting enough, um, you know, I, I did this Bette Midler, you know, Bette Midler. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So I did the album cover, this album cover for Bette Midler and, um, that album cover, then she, you know, I mean, she's before Madonna. So her, her, a big part of her whole, uh, uh, presentation is the presentation and is her costume, is the sets, is all that. That's a big part of her whole deal. So that, and that generally comes from the album cover. So anyway, um, I really like the album cover and all that, but there was this, uh, uh, this guy, this Japanese, uh, guy who was in the record business, um, and was a visual, uh, you know, did album covers. He did, he had a, he had a, a graphics business. And, uh, so it turned out that he loved that Bette Midler album cover, but never in a million years did I ever think that Bette Midler would do something for me in Japan, because I, I just saw Bette Midler as, you know, she's a big part of her thing is, is being a comedian. So his language and how, how that would come across, how that could be translated in, in, in Japanese culture. So anyway, but it turned out, and I'll tell you how it, she does translate, but so he loved that cover and he was, he came to LA to shoot like a Japanese pop star, do a video, a music video and this Japanese pop star. And he asked his location person if she knew me and if she did, how to get a hold of me. Because he loved that Ben Miller album cover so much that he made, that he made it a thing that he would love to one day work with whoever the artist is that did this album cover. He wanted to work with him. So he looked me up in Japan and what he looked me up when, when he was here and I had a five year run, big run with him. And he's the one that did the, the album covers and got me to be the artist for the Tatsuro um, covers. He's the one that, you know, and I, and I designed like a set for the Japanese Grammy awards and um, shows, different things. But then the whole thing, everything flatlined in the uh, early 90s uh there was a big recession after the japanese were buying up the world in the late 80s early 90s and then there was a big uh, all the all the all the real estate took a major major dive and um so that was it for my relationship with him but then i got another another company came in uh in the early 90s and um i had another big show in japan and Anyway, Japan is always there because of Tatsuro. Yeah. And uh, what about the time you worked for the Tonight Show with Jay Leno? Those were great set designs. I watched. I looked at the 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 photos. Right. Yeah. So how did that? I I I read that you were the first uh, independent uh, artist that the show. Oh, you really, you really. Thank you. You've really done your homework. This is <laughs> really. Amazing, great, but you're absolutely correct. Amazingly enough, amazingly enough, I was the first in the over 50 year history of that show. I was the first independent or freelance artist that did set work for that show. Amazing, which was not an easy thing to deal with because of unions. Right. Right, so this is an interesting story. So the art director, of the show was a big fan of mine. And so he he pushed for me to do this because they commissioned me to do, I mean, a whole collection of stuff, like backdrops that were like 28 feet by, I don't know how, 18 by 28 or something, and then floors. And I ha I live in a big uh, creative community here in downtown LA called The Brewery. And they're all big loft, they're, they're live, work, uh, live work situations, but we have like really high, 30 foot high ceilings, and um, so I, I had the I had the space to do them here, but the producers to get me to do this, it was a big deal with the unions. So they had to prove to the unions that I was a fine artist, that the unions could not provide to do this special conceptual idea. So the unions approved of me under one with one. Um, very interesting uh, caveat or, or um, requirement that I had to sign on the front. My my signature had to be on the front of the, of these backdrops because that is what proved 
that I was a fine artist and not a scenic artist because scenic artists do not sign the scenery. Oh, wow. So okay. These are like really big. So I couldn't sign my name. Like, you know, my, my name had to be in some relationship to the size of the piece. So my name, you know, Mirapolsky, it ended up being on camera a lot. Yeah. <laughs> For how long? Yeah. About what? It, it, almost, what, for seven years? I think 97, 2004. Yeah. About 200 shows from, from, yeah, from, uh, two, yeah, uh, you're right. Whatever the dates you said, those are the right dates. So that, that meant that all the, all the bands that came on the, the show that were, were popular and they were doing their live sets or segments performed against the backdrop that you designed. Not all of them. Not all of them. So I'll tell you. So what was going on at that time dynamically between the Tonight Show and then David Letterman show? Yeah. Those were the two big com com competitors, right? So David Letterman on his show was always the same generic set for right. every band. The Tonight Show, they came up with a concept, which they, you know, they didn't really have to do because it's a not Tonight Show, but they came up with this concept to really improvise and make a whole set that's designed specifically for a specific group. Mm. So, and that's where I, that was, I was part of that program. So I wasn't on every, I wasn't on every, every time they had, they had a band on, I wasn't on every single one, but I was on 200 and over of seven years. That's still a lot. If, if I was a comedian and I was on a tonight show, you know, 200 times, I, I should be a super successful by now. <laughs> yeah. But that must have felt great. You know, it's like, the Elton suit you've got, well. Oh, and I have Elton. I, right, I have Elton on the Tonight Show. So, so I, I cut that. That okay, that's right. Oh my God, I forgot. That's right. So I did a favor for this art for the art director of the Tonight Show, for something that he was designing. I designed these these banners for some film festival or something that at the at the Directors Guild that he was that he was in charge of. So he asked me to do these banners, and I and I did them, and I didn't charge them. Um, and then and then uh. Oh no, they paid me. They must have paid me. Yeah, because that that must they must have paid me. I'm sorry, because that came to the Tonight Show probably. So he took those banners. Those were the first things for the Tonight Show, and the first time those banners were on the Tonight Show was a performance of Elton John's on the Tonight Show. Right. So, so if I go to YouTube. If I go to YouTube and I, by some miracle, I find Elton's performance on Jay Leno that from 1997 then the backdrops that he was performing against were designed by you. Yes. Yeah. I, I, have, I believe have it's some there. I, have I some believe they're there. Yeah. I think they're there. But it's like, you know, when when you're not, when as an artist, you're not a rock star, so you're not in front of the cameras yourself. As you said, if if you had been, if if like, let's say, what what was the average viewership for a JLN Lino show? Like what, a million, two million, 10 million? 10, 15 yeah. million. Those are the million. old days when there wasn't a lot of competition. Yeah. So their, their numbers were up. All yeah, right. right. So if they saw you, right, but they didn't see you, they saw your art. That's a very interesting, that's a very interesting thing to be. You know, they're not seeing your face. Right. But in a way, they're seeing you through your art. Well, but see, but this comes back to me now, you know, being a senior now. I mean, this comes back to me all the time because people, they don't know me, or, but they know my art more than they know me because yeah. when i show certain things they go oh they recognize oh wow 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 you did that you did that you did that you know that that kind of thing and 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 that that does happen to me you know all the time and and in fact getting back to discovering the elton john fan clubs um you know this is 40 years i've gotten more play out of that piano outfit in the last two years <laughs> than i've ever gotten the last 40 years why do you think that happened? Because of these fan clubs. Because no. of you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, here we are. You're in Romania. And the yeah. thing that and the thing that brought us together was Elton John, right? Yeah. It's, it's really? That, that so, happened 43 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. But it's still like, as long as it's on TV and YouTube, that's why these things. And and, and thank God. And, and when I've collaborated with other artists, you know, I, I, I feel I, I've been really, really, really fortunate because I really haven't done a lot 
I, I, I haven't done a lot with different artists. It's just that all the artists that I've done anything with have all been huge. And 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 if anything, like I, I, as an example, I, I would say my, and don't, I hope this doesn't get out of them, but a, a weaker for me would, would be an album cover I did for Cheap Trick. And oh, Cheap I, Trick is a big band. Yeah. And and and, and they're a historical band and, and they're all seniors now too, but they're going stronger than ever. As a touring, as a touring act. What, what album they, was that? It was called The Doctor. The Doctor. I don't know that. Uh, I'm gonna look it up. You can look that up. It's a, it's a really great album, but, but it's not. No, it's an infamous album. It's supposed to be one of the worst albums they ever made. But okay. the best thing about they said they said this live at a concert I went to. They gave me credit. You know, they were joking that it's the worst album they ever did. But the best, it's the best album cover they ever had. Yes, so it's a fan with the fans of Cheap Trick is a famous album because it was not that great, but the album everybody loves the album cover. So, are you comfortable with uh, sort of positioning yourself behind your art? You know, with your art being a lot more popular than, uh, let's say, you are or your name is. Yeah, that's fine with me. Yeah, it, it all seems to catch up at some point because here we are catching up. You see? Yeah. Yeah. And and we're I mean you're in Bucharest. Yeah. Right. You speak English really, really well. Well thank you. You don't have like an accent, really. You Where know, you, you know you know why? Here's the thing. In in Europe, um most countries, uh I'm sure you know, or maybe you don't, you go to Germany, you go to Hungary, you go to Italy, Spain, they don't speak English at all. For the French, they don't they don't right. speak very well. No. And uh, what happens is they they dub their TV shows and their movies. You know, there's a like a Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. There's some Italian right. guy speaking on top of him, right? In Romania, they never do that. So when we grew up, we grew up with Hollywood movies on television all the time, and they were right. subtitled. They weren't dubbed. Uh, right. So when I fell asleep as a kid. I fell asleep with my dad and the television on watching some Hollywood movies. And it's like learning two languages at the same time, Romanian and English. And if you come to Romania, you'll realize that most people that were born after the fall of the communism, you know, December 1989. Uh, Chesco. Mm -hmm. Chesco. Chesco. Yeah, Ceausescu. Yeah. Right. Uh, after the fall of Ceausescu, when, when we started getting all these shows from, you know, Fox and stuff we get the david letterman show here we get a lot of stuff we used to get it in the 90s as well you'll find that most people my age speak english very well because they grew up with american pop culture even though they were in eastern europe the culture i grew up with i can say is i i i i consider myself a lot more american than romanian because you sound american i mean you, yeah, thank you, you. Sound american because Go the on. culture and you'll you'll find most people my age here the culture we've been exposed to was mostly American, especially after 90, after 1990, 1991. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's how, how old cool. are you? I'm 28. Oh, 28. Right. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. uh, yeah. Wow. Really interesting, man. Cause you, you really, you don't have an accent really. I can, and I'm into accents. So <laughs> I, 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 yeah. I saw a video of yourself. You were doing this. Uh, somebody interviewed you, and it was posted on a Google Talks um, channel on YouTube. And because uh, we were talking about December of nineteen eighty nine, and you, I, I, I think you mentioned something about that period because you were wearing some sort of a jacket, but I don't remember the con. The, the oh, that's right. No, that was my Google uh, Google Talk. Yeah, I, I had a fifty year retrospective. Viva LA. Yeah, fifty years in LA. That was in twenty nineteen, and. Uh, and as part of my show at Google headquarters in Venice, I did a Google talk, which is on there, I guess, forever now. Yeah. But but that was a jacket. That was an embroidered jacket. That that took me, I don't know. It took me like nine years. Those those jackets were not ex inexpensive. <laughs> and to where I could trade or pay or whatever it was, that I could get an embroidered jacket. Uh, that was my uh, that was my and on the back of it it's it's a heart but it's a power of dreams it's a it's a great piece but to to wear that again on television like I was explaining about the embroidery thread it looks great on camera because it reflects light so that that's my that's my uh, 
my Elton John costume. Version. I was thinking because you were talking about making outfits that are visible. It just occurred to me that, you know, having big screens at concerts is a fairly new invention. So when when you had to dress up an artist in the 70s or the 60s or the 80s, you had to come up with an outfit that had to be visible, you know, from an arena without the screens. Totally. So that's what I'm saying. When I was drawing, when I was drawing those, uh, the, the drawings, the night, you know, that night I was uh, waiting to get them picked up the next morning. All I was thinking about and sweating about was how do I, how do I do something on the outfit that will show up? You're right. Because they didn't have, like you said, they didn't have big screens in and all that stuff. And, and really the, that embroidery turned out to be a spectacular thing. Yeah. What do you love about L.A.? I noticed that a lot of your work is inspired by L.A. Uh, how long have you been living in L.A.? Well, 54 years now. 54 years. Yeah. That's crazy. What do you well, love? When I, when I came to America, it was either New York or L.A. And yeah. So I grew up on American pop culture, too. That that was my connection with America. And it wasn't like I 18 years solid. I was overseas because every three years, every two, three years, we would get home leave. My father worked for the, like the State Department kind of thing. Yeah. And we would get home leave and L.A. was our base. But in the 50s and 60s, when you worked for the for the American government, like State Department, you know, that was what that was an, a time, you know, when the dollar was absolute gold. And, and working for the State Department, you got to go on ships and travel and great hotels and everything was like first class. I, I don't know if it's I don't think it's like that quite anymore. But um. So I, I, we did come back to, to Los Angeles every once in a while, but my parents, they really enjoy traveling. So when we were given like three months uh, home leave, what they call home leave, three or four months, whatever that was, they enjoyed traveling more. So, and that, that was a time where you could take a ship, a slow boat and spend a month doing traveling and then only two months back in the United States. So they they always like to so I so I I had a I, you know I I did have a, a connection with with America I had a feeling and it was always and this is what's so bothering me about it now what's going on here now and um, it's really it's very depressing for me what's going on here now and because I, I always saw America as a shining light on the hill being smart and big and forward. And all that kind of thing, and a lot of, and I don't think it's quite like that anymore, especially with our political thing now with Trump, and I mean, it's just insane authoritarianism, which you know something about, and uh, totalitarian authoritarianism, and all that. Yeah, it can happen anywhere. Yeah, yeah. but at the time when you came to so the fifty four, that's nineteen sixty nine, right? Right. You came in the middle of the hippie movement, the counterculture, that whole. Yeah, I, I did, but I kind of missed it because um, I was overseas when that was really happening. Oh, right. And, okay. and, uh, and then by the time I came here, it was a big cultural shock for me to come by myself to the United States to go to school. And all I could do is just because um, in many ways, even though I grew up in societies where generally I was like a white person. And I and I had red hair, very red hair. So um, I I seem to always grow up in a sea of people with darker skins and black hair. So I I grew up with people always coming up to me, you know, and they were they were rubbing my arm and they were looking, you know, and all this stuff. So I um so it was a cultural shock coming to the, to America for me, and that's all I could do was just to keep it together. And you know, I came here to make my fame and fortune and follow the American dream and all that stuff. And uh, so I, I didn't, I didn't really get involved in anything, you know, overtly political then. It was all I could do was just go to school and deal with it. Do you think you could have achieved all the things that you've achieved if you lived maybe in Europe, if not for America? Do you think, you know, this land of opportunity as they, as they call it, helped you in some way? Yeah, I would think so. I, I would think so. So, so for me, it was either New York or LA. That was it for me. Uh, um, and honestly, uh, I and I want to be an actor. That's that's. I, I've been painting since I was eight, 
And that's always been my, sold my first painting to the American ambassador in Indonesia when I was like 10. And, um, but I, but I got into acting in high school and, and I, that's what I really want to be. So LA or Hollywood, whatever, a, a, a big part of uh, my decision making on on moving and coming to LA instead of New York, it was about the weather. It was about the weather, because I, I I went all the way through high school in Seoul, Korea. I was in Korea for four years, and that was really cold. And uh, I thought life is too short. <laughs> life is if you can if you can have a choice. Uh, I, I, enough for winter time. If you want to go skiing, if you want to go vacation in the snow or whatever, great. But as a regular thing, every single day, every single year, oh man, I, I thought LA is it. So Hollywood, and I grew up on Hollywood. Me too, with movies and you know television. That was that was. I would say that was my also for me. Even though I speak English and everything, you know, well, with, without having to learn from the subtitles or, but but I, I learned about America to a great degree because of um the media so um you know i i did i in my 20s i like i said in my 20s i did act a lot in shakespeare so um in the late 70s i, I was drawing and and i took drawings around to some out to record companies and i i did a couple album covers in like, like 79 and i made a short list of who i thought i would be right for to work for the music business because then I thought oh, I've done a couple album covers now I can get in the music business and I can do this and that and whatever so I made a, a short list of my my favorite my favorite uh, solo rock artist the Elton John uh, so that was, was that was that was like 10 years before you even designed the suit for him that was you're, you're talking no, late. That, that was about a, a year oh, okay it was about a year before okay so he was my solo uh, rock artist, Bette Midler, who I thought I'd be right for, you know, that I, I wouldn't have to stretch, you know, who I would just okay. you know, right. Right. So I, I thought I need a, a female. So that I picked Bette Midler. I mean, who else really at, at that time? So I picked that. And then as a band, my favorite rock and roll band would be the Rolling Stones. So within the next year, no, not no, no, not the next year. The next year, I got Elton in 1980, and then Bet happened in 82, 81, 82, and then the Stones. A, a little thing happened. A, a little thing happened with the Stones, but that was, uh, yeah, that was sometime in the late 80s. But at any rate, just bet between Elton and Bet um, alone, th those were major statements for them. What 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 did you do with the Stones? Well, it was just a, um, it was a benefit that they were involved with, with, with a Directors Guild Artist Rights Foundation. So I did, uh, I did, I did this logo for the Artist Rights Foundation. And then for the show that they were going to the Rolling Stones show, they had the Rolling Stones all over it. So yeah. that was, as, that was as close I got. Yeah. However, wait, no, it's in a story. So I wanted to I, I wanted to do something with the Stones, so I had a connection, and I ended up going to New York to meet with the uh, let's say the um, what do they call them the chief of staff for the Stones, and he was named and I didn't even realize I didn't even realize who he was until uh, I think I read Elton's book because this guy oh man what's his name he was really really famous. In, in the 60s in the rock and roll um of of England with um the stone with everybody. A Andrew something? No, it wasn't Andrew. Very famous guy, but he was a stylist guy. Everybody Tony and, King. Uh, Tony no. King. Very I good. I interviewed Tony King in February. No, in yeah, in February, yeah. Oh wow. Yeah, <laughs> Tony King. So I went to meet with Tony King and oh my I knew, god. I didn't know who he was. <laughs> I didn't really know who he was. So, um, but I was, I was told to meet him. So he was, he was going to connect me with the Stones. So here I'm in New York. I'm schlepping this. I did this big, I did this big piece on backdrop paper. And I'm schlepping this thing around, walking around. And I go to his office with this thing and I show him and he couldn't have been nicer and everything. 
And that's when he told me that that, that piano outfit was his favorite all time costume that Elton ever had. Wow. That's what he told me. And the, way after the fact, I learned that Tony King was like Mr. Taste and everybody loved yeah. him. Yeah. And funny guy. And no, everybody loves this guy. Yeah. So, so this is interesting. So, um, I was about, I was going to uh, Japan. Oh, that's right. I was going to Japan. I think about my, my that first trip to Japan when that guy picked me up, that that music producer from Japan, because of the Bette Midler, the Tatsuro thing. So um, that coincided with Mick Jagger. Wow, this is one of the wildest things I've ever seen too. Because Mick Jagger was doing, I think it, it he had an album, a solo album then, because it called Primitive Cool, which was actually a pretty good album. It was a very good album, but. That was a time where it was like the attitude of Mick Jagger was Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. He was seeing himself, it was him and the Rolling Stones, which it really is not. It is the Rolling Stones. And I saw that in spades. It's a band. It's not a solo. It's not a front guy with a bad. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a totally form-fitted band that's working together as a band like you know like nothing else right so anyway so he, he came out of that album and his, he was doing a, he was going to do a world tour and his first date was in tokyo and through tony king i i and my manager at the time who was how i got to tony king because he was he was kind of in the music music business and uh, so we got tickets to go see Mick Jagger at the uh, Tokyo Dome, I think it's called. One of the absolute weirdest shows I've ever seen in my life. So this really, is a solo solo show. Yes. Okay. This this was really it was really interesting because you know what, that show never left Japan, <laughs> and that was it. After those three shows he did in that Tokyo Dome, no more. It was over. That's how weird it was. And I was one of the few Americans, I think, that saw this very negative, but a historical thing, you know, with the Rolling Stones history. Because I, what he did, well, you know, no, no, that's right. They had big, that was, well, no, no, that was when, that was 88, I think. Yeah, that must have been 88. But they had big screens then. In 88, they had big screens uh, opposite on the stage. So what he did, he must have done 80%, more maybe, I don't know, but at least I'd say 80% all Stones material. Not from his new solo album, which is what he should have done. But no, he I... went back and took all, all these Stones hits. And, uh, and I'm sure that the band that he got to back him had to probably be the best session, you know, musicians you could probably buy. But they were not the Rolling Stones. So with him singing Rolling Stones music with not the band, it was so unright. It was so wrong. And his it, it, it looked, he looked like Saturday Night Live. He looked like somebody on Saturday Night Live doing a Mick Jagger impersonation. It just, it, the chemistry, you know what I mean? The subtleties, uh, all that, the, the, the chemistry of a band. And that really, really, really showed in absolute spades the group, you know, what a what a band does represent. And and the Rolling Stones is an absolute band. You know, they are a unit. They're they're a one unit. Yeah. And 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 that's what that proved without a shadow of a doubt. It's an infamous show. And from that show, he's never gone solo again. It's only with the band. So, Andre, what are your plans? What are you working on now? Well, right now, I talk about music. Uh, with Viva LA, we're, we're uh, working on, we've partnered with a magazine to present next year a Viva LA Music and Arts Festival here in LA. I saw the website, yeah. Oh, you did see the website. Yeah, yeah so that, that's, that's something we're, we're working on right now. Right, so you're planning to do a plan to get, you know, independent artists or more famous artists or 
Well, you know, depending on how how big the show ends up being, um, that will depend because uh, we're we're really gonna we're really trying on dealing with Los Angeles artists, people that are living in LA or really into LA. So, um, but if it's like a in a stadium, it's not easy to produce one of these. I I I, and I honestly I don't have a lot of experience doing this, and my Viva LA partner, he doesn't either. Although it's his idea. And the magazine went for it and everything. Anyway, um, so, you know, like a, 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 a draw, because I think we have to have celebrities. We have to have, you know, some kind of draws. So I'm thinking of like Red Hot Chili Peppers, who is a, an L.A. band, and they are very, very L.A. centric. And they are I, also. I look at the at the the art you're creating and your style and you mentioned Red Hot Chili Peppers and somehow in my head they fit together very well. Well, totally. Yeah, totally. Yeah. But they're really, really into L.A. And in fact, Flea, Flea has started um, a music school here that's become very successful. So, um, and they're all seniors too, but um, they're also, they've, they're also, um, they're not golden oldies. They're, they're still relevant. And in fact, their audiences are bigger than ever. Yeah, they're, I saw, they're, them, saw, them, saw them last year in Barcelona. And oh, you did? Yeah, and I'm I'm thinking, why do I keep thinking that the role uh the the Red Hot Chili Peppers are in their 30s when they're like in their early their 60s? 60s? They're in their 60s. Like, oh my god! Right. Yeah, they're right. incredible. They're incredible. No, they're working at their optimum, and this yeah. is why it's, it's it's very um you know I have this I have this uh you know this idea I don't know but that that rock and roll kind of ruined it for other for a lot of other art forms. A lot of other art because it was like the whole thing. If you weren't successful by your early twenties, you might as well just go home. Yeah, yeah. Because I think historically artists didn't really find themselves or something until like their forties or whatever. You know, yeah. In, in a way, yeah. Michelangelo, no, but uh, <laughs> I think you know for the most part, and and. Um, but that's changed now because now there really are a lot of rock and roll artists that are seniors are in their 60s and 70s. I mean, Mick Jagger is 80. Yeah. And he's right. still jumping around. He, he, he's still performing. The Stones are still performing and they're not considered golden oldies. I mean, Elton John is 76 and he's operating at his absolute maximum. Yeah. He's totally relevant. He's not a golden oldie. So that has come around. The ones that have survived you know, that survived everything that you could have as a as a rock and roll musician. The ones that have survived, you know, are still very relevant, which is very inspiring, you know, obviously, for me. Well, Andre, thank you very much uh, for your time. It was My, it was great to listen to you. Yeah, no <laughs> problem, no problem. It was it was great to talk to you. Uh, so what happens is, uh, uh, I will somehow get a playlist together and and dub. Uh, like translate our interview and 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 play it on our radio station and hopefully some thousands of people will hear it and then we'll put it up and we'll put this up on YouTube as well so they can see this as well. <laughs> oh, and also and also my website too. Great. Great. It was great talking to you. No, absolutely. You're a very cool guy. And what what do you what do you do in in Bucharest? Well, um, I'm getting a PhD right now in uh, progressive rock drumming. Uh, yeah, crazy. I know not a lot of resources for this. I'm a drummer. I'm basically a drummer, and I do I do session work. I I play with the, um, you know, the equivalents of all the names you've mentioned, but in Romania, right? You know, the the Tatsuro Yamashitas of Romania. You know, right, 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 right. So I I kind of do that. Well, I, I'm glad. I'm glad I brought up uh, Ray Cooper. Then. Oh yeah, yeah. I love. Yeah, because he's got to be like on top of the pyramid or something, and because he yeah. he, it seems like he can play anything. He'll he play can. anything. Yeah, he can. Yeah. He can. Right. And, uh, yeah. So like, about a few years ago, I because I've always been interested in these rock and roll stories and stuff, and uh, I had a chance to interview Pete Best, who was the first drummer in the oh. Beatles before Ringo. Right, sure. And uh, I said, well, it's easier to interview rather famous people than I thought. I mean, I just had to send you a message and you were like, yeah, sure, let's do it. And uh, I, th I found a, a new passion 
uh, which is, you know, I, I love stories. And when people have great stories to tell, like yourself, I'm here and I listen. And if I can bring those stories to the world, right. that's even better. That's even better. Well, this is what's so fabulous about this technology because we can do this for no money, really. I mean, you don't yeah. have to have a big studio to do it and yeah. all that. You get this person to do this and do that and do this. You can do all yeah. this. You're your own studio. Yeah, when I come to LA, whenever that happens, I'll give Please you a call. <laughs> Absolutely. Alex, thank you so much. Thank you Here's so much. Day. Thank you thank so you. much. And uh, good, luck. Pleasure. good luck with your festival and, uh, you know, whatever things you're working on right now. Thank you so much. I'm about to start working on Saturday. It's Labor Day holiday here in, in the United States, and so I'm going to be working. Okay. I'm going to be laboring for Labor Day. <laughs> okay. Happily. Well, happily. Yes. Have a great day. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.